live. Welcome, folks. Welcome, welcome back to the sloppy lab. <laughs> yeah. Welcome back, everybody. So we have a fun one today. I honestly wasn't sure. I've kind of like went back and forth whether we would have five minutes of content or like two hours of content, and uh, we'll see what we end up with <laughs> on this yeah, one. I was kind of like thinking, man, I don't know how much we can talk about this, and then you started giving me some of your ideas about what you had in mind for this, and that kind of like stirred some things up a little bit, gave me some ideas. Uh, got some help from the Sanctimonious Discord channel today with some data, which was nice. So I, I think we definitely got some good stuff today. Yeah, I'm excited. And uh, and you even put together kind of a, this uh, uh, a survey here to get get some get some opinions. And I'm look, just looking over it. Very, very curious to see like the spreads that we got. Um, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. Today we're talking about uh, luck, still, skill, and deck. Um, this was a topic that was uh, kind of brought about initially by the Time Shapers podcast folks, so Roar and Texlet, um, back in episode seven, I think I think it was, yeah? yeah. I think it was seven, yeah, great yeah. episode. If you haven't listened to it, you should definitely listen to it. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll I'll be putting the uh, putting a link to that that episode in our show notes. I'm sure, I'm sure our audience is uh, very familiar with their work. But hey, you know, absolutely. Um, so yeah, uh, great great listen, and we're going to be kind of building off that, riffing on some of the stuff there, revisiting some of the topics, and then folding in some of our own ideas. Um, so so really cool, um, and probably briefly though worth just recapping what we mean by luck skill deck. Um, uh, so, uh, I think you have a couple of announcements first. Oh, <laughs> we have two more. You want to start those first? Yeah. I think, you know what? We almost need a, a regular segment of, uh, stuff not tonight one since the last time we talked. I was, was going to make the same suggestion. <laughs> So this it's week, crazy. Um, yeah. <laughs> this week on stuff not tonight. One, uh, congratulations to our teammate not tonight uh, for uh, coming in the top four of the Polish Grand Champs. So very cool, very exciting. They had a great turnout. Uh, she went undefeated, completely undefeated in day one, and uh, and finished in the top four of the event overall. Uh, sounded like an awesome event. Huge congrats to her. Absolutely. In person, key forge forging IRL. Um, Pretty awesome. I did some IRL forging last weekend too. Uh, not at a big event like that though. So that's super cool that they could do that. And congrats to her on a, a really strong finish again. Yeah, and we had one other teammate there who um, who survived uh, <laughs> in his own words. <laughs> in his words. <laughs> so congrats to Crusader for surviving uh, and get you know getting to go out and play some uh, some key forge IRL with not tonight and some other uh, some other folks who are kind of familiar from around the the uh, discord verse of, of Keyforge. So I know Caveld was out there. Um, uh, a few others that I'm probably not going to pronounce so <laughs> correctly, so I might not try, but names you'd recognize on site for sure. <laughs> yeah, the, the event was largely supported by Team Can't Touch This, which is a Polish group, which we kind of stole a few of their members from into Sloppy Lab work. Mm -hmm. um, so really cool that they have like a active community engagement like in person too whereas um you and i are spread out geographically um so is now in stereo we all are so we don't really have the chance to do like a in-person sloppy lab work kind of event so it's really cool that they could do that in poland yeah very cool we have a we actually have a decent number of not only states but also countries covered so pretty pretty cool that is true yeah pretty many cool. miles indeed yeah. indeed um <laughs> there was another announcement you want to make about the um nkfl Right? Yeah, you know more yeah. About the yeah. So uh, they're starting a new event series, and I'll I'll put some uh, more details to this in the show notes as well. But this is going to be an uh, eight event series, and I think that they were debating between a league structure or a one day tournament structure. I'm pretty sure that they landed on single day events uh, for these. But there's going to be four uh, four Archon events, uh, one dedicated to each set. Uh, and then another four. So the first four are going to be uh, SAS cap, uh, capped at 80, and then the second four are going to be unrestricted. Um, so yeah, should be fun. If single day events are your jam, I encourage you to check it out. Should be well attended. Uh, looked like there was a lot of interest and excitement kind of there. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do 
you want to hear more about our thoughts on SASCAP, you can watch last week's episode. <laughs> Absolutely. We didn't talk about 80 SASCAP, though. That was a little bit higher. So interesting. Yeah. Uh, without going too far, it's uh, that's definitely one that feels to me like we're trying to kind of call the monsters as opposed to really shake things up. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely going to be some really good decks in that, that range as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. So. All right. Uh, Lex skill, <laughs> skill deck. Hopefully I haven't missed any other announcements. <laughs> I think that was it. Cool. I'm going to start watching. Cool, cool. Uh, so, yeah, Lux skill deck. And uh, you, you may be able to explain this better than I, um, but uh, I'll give it. I'll take a pass here. So really the idea is that uh, when you kind of sit down to play a game of Keyforge, um, there are these three components that go into determining who's going to win, right? So there's luck in my getting more more or less lucky than you in this game there's skill am i playing more skillfully and then there's deck you know is my deck just inherently better better or worse than yours or better suited for whatever we're playing and i think we're going to generally assume assume archon um when we're talking today so we're, we're kind of talking about the good decks uh, not your reversal monsters as it were um and yeah, yeah. that sounds about right and one thing i also wanted to say is these are kind of vague terms in a way, like maybe like one person plays better in some ways and maybe not as well another way. These are kind of just guidelines. It's it's not supposed to be a perfect science. And I think especially when you look at deck, there's obviously matchup as a consideration too. Um, someone could bring a great deck and play against a bad deck. Maybe the bad deck has a good matchup and it can win. So like this isn't like a perfect science kind of thing, but it's a really interesting exercise, I think, to consider it because... I think when you go into Keyforge, like when I first started, I know I did this, you have a very preconceived notion about how um, the meta and how the whole game itself is going to, to shake out. Like you think about pre-constructed decks like this and you think, well, someone's just going to have the best deck and I'm not going to be able to win and, and that's it. But then you dig deeper into it and we'll talk more about this too. You, you realize there's these other aspects to the game as well. Um, and I think the results we got from our survey kind of show that there's not like total agreement on how big it, each of these are. And I think that's a really good thing. Um, it's kind of a mystery still in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, I think the fact that there is mystery is kind of a testament to the depth of the game. And uh, I, I know I get very excited about kind of looking at uh, looking at this idea and peeling things away when, when you can start using those insights to kind of uh, ask, you know, ask whether there are decks better suited for formats like adaptive i know that's one that we'll, we'll hint at maybe towards the the end if we kind of get there um but you know one of the one of the kind of debated topics in the game is you know can there be a deck that's better suited for adaptive than another or uh you know a question that we might get to uh you know, is it ever right to bring a swingy deck you know um uh, so yeah, kind of i think kind of, we might have a whole episode about um, like what makes a good adaptive deck, you know, like there's a lot we could say on that. And a lot of people have some pretty strong opinions on that too. Um, so I see you're sharing the, the data here that I put together in, in a very ugly format. I tried to make in, in typical sloppy lab work style, I tried to make graphs and charts and, uh, it just wasn't coming out right. In sheet, so I don't know. <laughs> I, I need some more practice. Um, but I still think there's like some cool things that we can take from here. Um, I just put together like some of the basic stats at the bottom, but um, you'll notice that people generally put luck a lot lower than I expected. I definitely thought we would get a lot of people saying like luck was a bigger factor, when in fact the highest percentage anyone attributed to luck was 35. And if you look at the other two, skill and deck, people attributed that in some cases up to 60%. Um, so definitely I didn't expect there to be that many comments saying that luck was that small of a factor, but obviously when you're dealing with a Discord who is so active and like dedicated to the game if it was very high in locker if they thought that then they probably wouldn't still you know necessarily be here or be as active as they were um skill is is an interesting one at 60 um i will give a spoiler i actually put skill at 60 i that's where i i thought it was and um you kind of talked about like when you start and you kind of like start to learn the game's depth and see how much it has and i I just remember a number of times when I've been playing this game and learning things that like the more I learn, the less I know, you know, like mm. I, I watch some people like not tonight and now in stereo play. And if I'm watching them with like the hands open or something like that, 
it's just kind of like sometimes I just shake my head like I have no idea like what they're like doing almost but it's a it's a good thing like they just can sometimes play like players like that on a level that I haven't really like thought about and it's really interesting and like the more times you see that you realize like man I thought I was like I thought I had this game down you know and then you see some crazy stuff and you're just like there's just so much more depth to it than you thought and so that's kind of a big reason why I put skill as high as I did because just it's I don't think the game gets the credit that it's due from other gamers I think they definitely think that it's more luck and more deck um, but then when you play it and you learn and you see how much depth there is and especially in the later sets um, it just to me is like man I mean we're just kind of patting ourselves in the back we love this game but like it's <laughs> to me it's like it's highly underrated as far as how much skill is involved in this yeah no I would agree I I would put I'm going to shamefully admit that I, I, I want to admit to the teacher that I didn't uh, didn't know we were supposed to put in our own answers, you know. <laughs> um, well, I didn't take it, so I, I never would have known that. Yep, yep. Um, but I, I, I think this is a, it's an interesting breakdown, right? Because I think there are absolutely thresholds, and um, this is this is a kind of a great metaphor to tie in because uh, I'm a squash player, much like Richard Garfield, also a Keyforge player, right? And I think uh, if I'm going to make a really bad sports analogy. You know, squash and tennis are kind of great comparisons here, and I'm going to explain that, which is tennis is just an abysmal sport to play if you have no idea what you're doing, um, whereas squash you can kind of make do. And I think there's, uh, I think there's like this, this is like zero to sixty, like zero, like getting up and running, reasonably well. You can do passably in KeyForge without tons of skill. Like you can feel like you're playing the game, like making stuff happen. Um, but getting the, getting over the, um, getting kind of to like that mastery level really, really is kind of skill intensive, super skill intensive. Um, and so I, I put, I put skill very highly on a breakdown like this, um, because I think that, uh, the margins that a games are decided by are almost always, you know, very, very, very often, uh, drawing from that skill button, a skill button, uh, bucket um to comprise that margin right so yeah so if you had done your homework what would you have put here i would have put probably i probably would have put skill in the 50 to 55 range probably deck in the mm, 35 40 range and luck very small whatever's left over i don't know Interesting is that I, I was the first response on here. Um, I just wanted to do it before I, I uh, shared it out. So the very first line there is mine. Mm -hmm. And I'm realizing just now that I had the lowest, and I was the only person to put deck <laughs> below 20. And I put it at 15. I used to think that, um, you know, the deck was, you know, almost everything. You know, I would have put deck at probably 40 or 50 a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I think maybe this is just kind of how I interpreted the question. And I realize, I totally recognize that, we asked this question without very much context and that was by design. And I just kind of wanted people to say like, okay, in an Archon format, what do you think about this? And I didn't really want to put too many qualifiers in, but one of the things that I was considering is that if, if we're thinking about Archon decks, think about like a high end tournament where everyone's bringing a really good deck. If everyone's bringing like their best deck they have, that's when I would put deck at about 15. And maybe mm -hmm. that's not fair. Maybe I just misinterpreted my own question. Maybe other people interpret it different. But like it, that's different than like coming to a casual, you know, um, chain bound event with your locals, where you might bring an 85 and someone else brings their best deck, which is like a 70. And then deck's going to have a bit bigger of an impact there than it would. Um, but I was kind of thinking it in terms of like one large event where everybody knows they're bringing really good decks, and you've got good decks against good decks, and then like how much of the rest of it comes down to to skill and luck. And so that's kind of where I came from. But um, I don't know. Interesting that I, I just saw this now that I had the lowest number there for deck. That's all. It's uh, your skill shining through, you know. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I'm, that's what I like to think. But um, yeah. maybe maybe someday we'll have a segment. What did Quick Draw win this week? But <laughs> I don't think that's happening anytime soon. No, it's uh, it's it is interesting though, and I think I think you make an excellent point. Like for for each of these, we're kind of assuming. And uh, I see kind of uh, one star peeps, five star games making a similar comment um, uh, in the chat here that there's there's sort of a, a baseline that we're assuming, right? We're, we're, we're taking for granted that folks aren't going to come 
and you know call a house discard and pass every turn and then say well it's obviously all skill right um you we kind of assume some level of of ability uh with the game some level of like uh, uh baseline baseline quality for decks that folks are bringing um so i think kind of in that world i yeah i'm i'm, I'm much more inclined to agree with you um and especially especially in if we branch out a little bit from archon into formats like like a nordic hexad where you can uh, do some lineup shaping and, and some avoid avoid more of these like really bad matchups where you might might just encounter a rough bounce on a matchup in a in a one deck archon like an archon solo yeah. type event. The hex ad is like to an extreme, but we can use triad as a more like relatable example for people that have played triad maybe haven't played the hex ad before. I haven't played the hex ad. To me, I look at it; it's very complex. Um, but when you're adding in extra decks to the mix like that, you're actually kind of I think combining deck and skill and you're like putting in some extra because you know making the proper ban or in the hex ad format like a proper safe is definitely a skill um but since you're also bringing more decks you're also increasing the uh importance of deck when you have like an event of that size or uh you know you're bringing that many decks at one time um so it does kind of change the equation i think when you're talking about more than one deck in these Mm -hmm. other formats Mm -hmm. um but you know we talked about um, Newton a few weeks ago, and like Newton, I think tries to neutralize the deck aspect of it, and um, you're still going to have some luck in game luck, but um, you know there are different formats that will kind of favor some of the luck skill deck, and some of them will try to mitigate others. So um, there's definitely ways to kind of find what suits you as a player. Um, maybe if you like deck, maybe you like to play Chainbound Archon or something like that. I'm you know I'm not sure, but there's definitely different formats I think that are catered and like trying to to solve this question. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I see a I see a Zodid has a question in the chat too. Um, kind of how we how we account for you know good matchups versus bad matchups. Um, how does that kind of fold into play here? Because there certainly are there certainly are good matchups and bad matchups, right? And I think you could you could walk in with your Heart of the Forest decks against the zero, the zero R, no exalt kind of like uh, kind of thing across the table, and just say, well, this doesn't feel like a fifteen percent, fifteen percent deck um, yeah, decided wonder, matchup. Like, I used, to, I think, deck does kind of comprise the matchup as well, but like maybe in the case of like heart versus no R, maybe that's luck. I don't know. Could be a little bit of each. Um, I don't remember if the Time Shapers podcast specifically addressed that, mm-hmm. uh, but. It is definitely, you know, another one of those kind of gray areas in this conversation um, to think about that. But, um, oh, let's, one star peeps, five star games wants to talk about uh, luck in chess. Um, you can get lucky if your opponent makes a mistake. Um, chess, to me, I, I used to play a lot of chess when I was younger. Um, I played a bit through college, and it's a great game, I think, if you're not like a top table player, like a grandmaster. <laughs> but I think when you get to that level, the game becomes to me less interesting. Um, you know, it's not quite, uh, maybe it's solved technically, but it doesn't seem like it'd be that much fun. And we talked about this, I think, in our first or second episode where like a good game should have a little bit of a luck factor. And Keyforge has that. And I think that's a good thing to keep people interested in it and kind of keep things um, changing. Whereas in a game like chess, you have perfect information and the only thing you don't know is what your opponent's going to do. But if you're at like, if you're both like grandmasters and you're in the high top tables of a big tournament, then you can generally know what your opponent's going to do, especially in the opening game. After a couple moves, you can see what's going on. So to me, like I, I just love having some luck involved, and I don't, I don't want to get luck to zero. Some people might like intuitively mm-hmm. think like luck is bad, you know, get it out of there, make it all skill. But um, then you'd end up with something like chess, which could make it a little bit less interesting in a lot of cases. Yeah, having having uh, an element of luck, and I'm I'm gonna say I I don't uh, I don't know that I would call you know oh my opponent made a mistake uh, luck in the sense that that we mean here necessarily um, I I think of it as you know here when we're talking about luck we're we're saying okay there's there's a random variable at play and it bounced my way or it didn't bounce my way um, uh, sort of sort of thing um, my opponent makes a play mistake I'd put firmly in the in the skill camp. It happens. It could be uncharacteristic for a strong player, um, uh, but I'd still put it in the skill camp. And um, and you know, I think 
yeah, uh, maybe I gave you time to think while I put the, R, the R, uh, heart of the forest, hard R question to you, uh, or myself time to think <laughs> while I put the question to you. But um, there was, there was kind of this, uh, I think, I think when we consider luck, skill and deck, we almost have to do it sort of at a macro level, not at like an individual matchup, matchup level. Um, I think you have yeah. to zoom out and kind of look at the game as a whole, uh, look at kind of matchups holistically as opposed to individually. Um, and, and this is kind of like, I don't want to jump, jump ahead too much. Um, but, uh, but I, I think that it is very interesting to consider luck skill and deck at a micro level, like at an individual matchup level. Um, but for here, when we're talking these percentages, yeah, I think we're, we're kind of zooming out past the scope of, of like, well, there's a bad matchup, it might happen, like, sure, but there's also no free lunch, so you're going to get the other side of that coin at some point. Um, yeah. Yeah. There was a point in um, the Time Shapers podcast when TechSlut suggested maybe adding style to this, mm-hmm. and that, like, to me, got me really thinking, and I actually, I kind of agreed with it, and I kind of want to talk through it with you and see kind of what you think about that. Um, would you consider style to be, um, like, already a part of skill, or is it something that's maybe like separate from that? And like to kind of like set the table a little bit for you, um, I guess what I'm also wondering is, can two people play the same deck with very different styles and both be playing correctly? Like both be playing well? Like maybe this person likes to um, just continuously wipe the board and just you know, or is there like does each deck have a, especially in a specific matchup, does it have a right way to play it? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I think that there are uh, there are like objectively correct plays in a given situation. I don't think that there's necessarily um, an absolute correct way to play one deck every time. Um, now, I think that some decks uh, lend themselves to to certain styles, if you will. And when I I, I actually re-listened to this episode today, kind of getting mentally prepared for uh, for having the discussion now. And I really liked TechSlot's point on style and how, you know, how does that fit in? And kind of when I think of style in this way, I think of, um, you know, a player having intuitions that or inclinations that most often line up with things that are correct for the, that are decisions for the correct for the deck. Um, and that can fold into skill in the sense that, um, uh, uh, in the sense that you're you're taking that as sort of a short a shorthand for kind of these deep things, and maybe it's a maybe it's kind of uh, something that you've gained uh, um, uh, through practice or experience, and that's something I would fold in. Though I'm not sure Aurora would have agreed in the episode. Um, and then I think there's a flip side, which is um, uh, the things that I find fun. I'm going to do more often, but they're not necessarily correct, and that's kind of a, the other elephant element of style, of style, and that's one that I would kind of uh, carve out as just something different. And I think you can you can kind of decide, like, well, am I going to lean into my intuition, and that's maybe correct or incorrect, and that folds into skill, or am I going to lead into what I think is fun because I'm playing a game, but not necessarily putting that in the luck skill deck kind of uh, categories. I don't know. Yeah, that I think was my if take. We're playing, <laughs> if we're playing for fun, I feel like it's a much different question than the Lux Skill deck. You know, there's there's an, a whole other variable in, involved if you're trying to have fun. You know, mm-hmm. um, but I like there might be more than one correct way to play a deck. But I wonder also, like, if you're talking about a specific matchup, like, say I'm playing my favorite deck versus your favorite deck. We both know these decks well. We know each other's decks well. I might know the best way to attack yours, uh, and vice versa. Does that mean that, you know, that is the only objectively right way to play it? Or does that mean that, like, someone else could pick up my deck and see a, a different line? Maybe, <laughs> I don't know, like, it's, it's obviously it's not a perfect science, but I, I wonder, too, if, like, style and, you know, Dinobot was asking what styles are there. I don't know if I have a good answer for that, but, like, some people like to play the board more. Some people like to just play all their cards um i think archiving is a huge topic that we could talk a lot about with skill Mm -hmm. um to me personally i I think archiving decisions could come down to style um could come down to a lot of skill um knowing what to archive and when and when to pull it um i have a deck that i played against you a couple weeks ago um for the newton match 
that has two very different avenues it can go down with the archiving. It can either archive a lot of uh, the unfathomable creatures and wait for like a wait for them to spend their board wipe, and then you pick up like eight creatures and play them all. Or it can archive a bunch of stuff, including data forge, and then try to pull off a big data forge, something like that. So like I think those are different styles, um, but they're also very skill intensive decisions that you have to make on the fly, like as you go through a game. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure, like that's kind of like a good example in my head of a deck that um, might cater to two different styles and could could be correct either way. Yeah, I think that, I mean, there could absolutely be strong strategies. I'd, I'd probably argue in favor for there being an, an optimal or maximal one, or at least I can, there's no reason you couldn't have multiple maximal styles or optimal styles. Um, I'm uh, uh, having flashbacks to all of my classes on like reinforcement learning and, and <laughs> training, training models for these things where like you sp may spend a lot of time believing that you have one maximal strategy and then d d decide that there's another and there could be, there could be competing maximums, but um, it's, it's interesting. And especially in a game like Keyforge where, you know, it is a race and 11 turns is 11 turns. And if you can get there with the data forge on turn 11 versus forging with key key three naturally on turn 11 by a decisive margin, like those are kind of both in the, uh, in the, like you did it camp. <laughs> um, so like they, they both got you there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, can we, I guess like take that archiving, topic and maybe like shift over to consistency because you and i had a lot to say about consistency i think when we were mm -hmm. chatting about this earlier um and consistency is like a way i think we both see it as a, a way of uh minimizing the luck element because consistency you're either uh, you play a deck that might always be able to consistently do the same thing and that way you have that kind of variable minimized where sure you're gonna have some luck at the draw but at least you know that you're always going to kind of run into the same situations or you have like a way to to play to your outs. So like you have a few good examples of your decks that you thought had different types of consistency, right? I did. Um, yeah, a couple, one, one that was a recent open that I'm, uh, enjoying experimenting with currently it's, you know, very efficient, uh, you know, not tons of expected Amber, um, you know, plays, plays very grindy, but has sort of this inevitable, like I'm going to archive a whole bunch of things going to, purge a whole bunch of your stuff and we're just kind of kind of grind to grind to the, the same kind of end game state each time and and uh, you know the, f the first five turns might look different but the second five turns often look very similar um, and and so even though you know I'm going to be playing maybe a different creature with Kirby I'm still going to be um, I'm still going to be kind of setting up these uh, game states that converge on on things that look very similar and it does it by your your kind of typical high F, you know, play lots of things, uh, archive lots of things, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, typical strategy. So you see that big, that big number in the speed box. Um, this is kind of doing that thing. And the reason I like the other as sort of a foil a counter example, um, is it actually has a negative, negative F score. Um, but still, I would argue maybe even a more consistent deck than the one that I just showed. Um, and it does that uh, more through kind of redundancy and relying less on, on synergies. So this deck's really just kind of like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live and die by the Delta. I'm going to play out my pips. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of get more or less the same value from each card that I'm playing each turn. And I'm going to kind of do that for seven turns and that's going to be the game and that's kind of like what it does and you might get a different three cards on turn three in one game than another but they they play out very similarly and you kind of see that amber progression look very much the same game over game do you think that has anything to do with this being a coded deck because you know how <laughs> I, I kind of feel coded decks are like a lot of times they're very straightforward they're like play cards get value yeah this turn, you know? this is definitely the like the like, hey, I have lots of pips. I, I'm not going to really worry about the board a whole, whole lot. Um, Coda deck where that's that's kind of what it's doing. Um, now, that's not to say that there aren't uh, there aren't important decisions, especially especially uh, in the current meta where creature control is kind of at a premium. You know, 
you do find yourself at times chaining yourself with the spirit's way because it is such a crucial card and you do find yourself scratching your head and saying like okay how am i going to like deal with the odoac when it comes because i need to have a plan for that or it's just going to shut me down um so there there are there are important decisions and i i don't want to kind of uh belittle it too much um but uh yeah no i, I didn't yeah. i didn't mean it really as a negative thing you yeah, yeah, no, no. Well, i think it's a lot of fun um but it's interesting because i think i t- kind of talked about how like when i first started playing maybe i would have put skill a lot less and maybe that has something to do with with coda maybe during coda maybe skill was a smaller factor i think the cards were a little bit simpler a little bit more straightforward um i just on the other end, end of the spectrum for me personally i love dark tidings so much mm-hmm. and i think the reason is because there are so many complex cards in there there's so many intricate de- decisions to make and i think that's probably a big reason why i put skill as high as i did on the scale today um so you know that's just one extreme to the other i think coda to dark tidings um interesting that you you showed these two decks like one with the efficiency of the archiving and the the um, speed and then one with the redundancy and the consistency um i when i was trying to think of two consistent decks did the exact same thing as you did um i have two mass mutation decks one of them has um pretty good amount of archiving with an auto encoder it has a ton of draws with um armory officer now two transporter platforms and a ton of upgrades um so if we look at uh that one first um it's uh ableson it it um it, it can really get rolling with consistency if like it finds the auto encoder anytime in like the first half or so of the deck um it's kind of a grindy deck as well like the two effervescent principles it's got the garcia with two platforms so you can really like kind of delay things a lot until you can get set up and then once you get it going like you said it's you know the first five turns might look different but then after that like the end game is pretty similar um it can draw its deck a lot it has the uh, auto encoder um the ivory card is not usually a major factor in here but like there's a lot of games where with auto encoder you can just kind of get it rolling and then from there it's like every turn is big after that um so this is very similar to your first example i think where it's got a very high speed um a lot of archiving stuff and, and just drawing and playing cards uh, and then the other example is scoundrel grigorov which is mm-hmm. sort of like the same as your combi grieve where it is consistency through redundancy. It is a negative F as well, I think. And it is just like five board wipes and a bunch of big creatures. And you just, <laughs> you know, carefully have to use your board, but you generally know that you're going to be drawing creatures and board wipes pretty much every turn. So um, I just thought that that was interesting that we both kind of went towards the same different like ideas of consistency when we looked at our decks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I think it's also worth noting too that you know high efficiency doesn't necessarily mean high consistency in the deck. I think I've seen you were marking before too that there are plenty of plenty of high efficiency you know typical logos packages uh, type decks that that do feel swingy. That you know maybe sometimes the efficiency lines up perfectly and you chain your Igors and it feels like you're flying through the deck or you chain your Lithologicas and you fly through the deck. And other times it's, you know, you hit a roadblock and, and it feels like a completely different deck. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think I kind of see efficiency is like lumped into one number, but I, I think drawing and archiving are two very different types of efficiency. And I think the drawing, I would tend to think the drawing has more luck involved with it and the archiving has more um, the skill involved with it. So if I see a high F deck, I'm more interested in it if it has archiving as opposed to just like a bunch of draws or um, maybe the milling even too. Like the archiving, I would much prefer to have with my efficiency. Dinobot saying, looking at you, Ultra Gravitron. But Dinobot, did you realize that this deck has animator and transporter platform too? Extra Ultra Gravitron shenanigans. <laughs> yeah, you, I've seen you like pull off some crazy stuff with that one. Didn't you say you've played Gravitron twice in a turn a couple times? Oh yeah, and the and the really fun thing too is the Gravitron has a capture and a draw pip, so you often end the turn uh, with yeah ten cards in archives, maybe more if you've also played your Cronus, but also um, also a couple of captured amber on the uh, on the uh, transporter platform itself, which is uh, really? very it's funny really sweet to have a draw pip on the gravitron because mm-hmm. if you're flying through your deck like that and you have a chance to play him twice you might archive like the last three in your deck and then you mm-hmm. can platform him back and then you draw pip to flip the deck and then archive five more so that's yep. a really useful draw pip on him there 
it is funny really funny but yeah cool stuff cool stuff um i think there was another point we wanted to talk about before we got to a game um and the game is actually a really cool idea we we talked about like how do we play a game to kind of illustrate this and i think what we landed on is pretty nice was there anything else you wanted to touch on with the I... skill draw I let's see we're we're kind of going going a little bit long but I wanted to just tee up one thing for when we kind of segue this into a conversation down the road about adaptive uh, adaptive decks and that was that was actually something that completely independently came up on the time shapers uh discord earlier today and it's the idea that uh luck skill and deck are not necessarily uh independent of one another um and that's not to say that like you know one deck is inherently lucky, although I like maybe believe that Denizag is. I don't know, <laughs> but uh, but that they have maybe different decks have different relationships with luck, um, and then that can uh, that can kind of have an impact with how the luck and skill impact gets distributed, especially under chains in an adaptive setting. Um, but I have some very sloppy. Uh, I have some very sloppy charts that I'm going to pop up on the screen here. It's interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, you showed me this. And I, I didn't want a full spoiler because it was like I thought it was really good stuff, and so I'm eager to hear more about it from you now. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is kind of laying, just kind of laying. I mean, it's going to sound very, very simple when we talk through it, but going to be kind of laying foundation for for some some other stuff we talk talk through. Uh, yeah, oh we. <laughs> but the idea is like, well, we talk about we talk about deck and we quantify deck strength very often just in with with saths i mean and we talked a lot a lot about saths uh last week but we say oh my deck is an 85 my deck is a 70 it's a 65 whatever and it's very easy to like get into the mindset of like my deck strength is one number and and the idea was like well no maybe maybe your deck is actually a random variable that has some that has some kind of distribution and uh, have this really fancy probability density chart here in front of us. And it's got, you know, unitless axes with kind of strength on the, on the x-axis and then the probability density on the y. And the, the, the idea here is that, you know, uh, I'm kind of plotting how likely my deck is to achieve different strength values, right? And, and maybe I've got some, some mean value here that's right around 75 made up units. You could think in terms of SAS if it helps you um just kind of make the bridge but uh maybe my deck punches at a strength of 75 most often and i think i even yeah have some others to, to layer into but on a given day you know we could talk about luck as choosing a random point underneath the curve and saying like well that's what your deck's going to punch at with the shuffle right and so at a micro level um we kind of see a relationship between deck which is kind of this curve and each deck's going to have its own curve and its own shape and luck, which is me choosing, like I'm going to draw a, a luck line and say, okay, maybe my deck can get up to a hundred on a good day, but you know, with the shuffle right now, it's punching at an 80 level, a level 80, you know, and maybe if I had shuffled differently or if I had rolled differently when, you know, hitting with my barb, mine barb, I'd be landing right around 50 or something. Right. Um, but, it gives us a natural way to talk about consistent decks, right? A consistent deck you'd expect to see have a uh, have a graph that's kind of kind of narrow and and one one solitary spike. Um, maybe uh, a consistent deck that's a little bit less strong but has kind of a similar uh, similar profile might be this 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 yellow one over here. It looks like it's got a similar profile, but yeah, you see it kind of left shifted. Um, so kind of two curves roughly about as about as wide um one one kind of farther up the scale than the other and you know maybe when the blue deck here rolls an 80 well there's not really a great way for yellow deck to achieve 80 and uh, no matter what no matter what uh yellow deck lands on the luck scale it's just going to have an uphill battle and maybe that's how that's how kind of uh, how it's going to be that day for yellow deck. Um, but there's opportunity that it's definitely possible that, you know, blue deck's going to roll something in the, in the 40 range and yellow deck's going to roll something in the, in the 50, 60 range. And you have an interesting game. And then we can talk about skill as being kind of an ability to nudge up or down, depending on how things land. Um, 
but I, I, I think it's kind of an interesting kind of, kind of way to frame the idea and uh, gives you kind of another way to talk about what an inconsistent deck look like, looks like. So maybe if this is a reasonably consistent deck, maybe your combo deck looks like, like this red one here where there's a spike on the left side where you didn't really hit your combo and then a spike on the right side where you did. Um, and now I think it's uh, kind of the, the payoff down the road is like, well, what does this mean for, uh, for deck selection for different formats like adaptive or for events like, um, like a bring any deck you want each round Newton, where maybe you, you want a spiky deck if you're like, Hey, I'm facing quick draw and I just kind of want to like eliminate the, the skill portion, you know, or, or, or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I love this because I, you know, in thinking and approaching this episode and this, this this topic, I always thought of deck as like a, a fixed variable. And then you started talking about like maybe it's more random or it's on a sliding scale, and that like I didn't hadn't considered that. And I thought like, well, no, that's not really that's not really what we're talking about. But then you kind of explain it, and I can totally see this. And it definitely does change. You know, it, it I think it changes how you think about the luck scale deck because if a deck is not just like the singular fixed thing and it can change then it it makes a complex question even more complex but it's not wrong either it's like i think we should be thinking of it like this because as we all know you know you can have uh you know a really good say like 85 saz deck and you might be able to beat like something that you know one of all tour maybe you have a game like that mm -hmm. but then you turn around and you're like playing against someone who's goofing around with like a 65 and in, in the competitive queue and they like crush you and like that happens you know like it, it definitely has a range and it's not just matchup based, you know, it's, it's about how well your deck um, can put things together. And maybe sometimes it's, it is matchup, but sometimes th there's the luck, but it's hard to kind of have the discussion of deck as like a, a sliding scale like this and separate it from, uh, from luck, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but it definitely reframes how you think about it when you look at like the different range of outcomes that a deck can have. Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely and i do think that this is very like like if there's the kind of micro macro scale this is kind of like we're looking at specific matchups perhaps like it doesn't you know when you talk about a curve in this way you really have to have two decks in mind um it's it doesn't make as much sense if you're kind of zooming out in the way we broke down kind of luck scale deck into different percentages before um but but interesting interesting nonetheless and some will hopefully yield itself to some interesting thought experiments yeah. Yeah. Um, there was so much discussion in Sanctimonious today. It was really cool to see. And I think a lot of people had some interesting takes on it, too. There's some really cool stuff that was said in there. Um, I don't have any quotes offhand, but there was one that kind of like piqued my interest because it was something that we were already talking about discussing in the future. Um, it might have been around adaptive. I'm not sure. I, I don't remember what it was, but uh, I did see a comment that someone kind of came to a conclusion. That I was like, haha. So like we had a very similar conversation to that and i think we're going to talk about it in a couple of weeks so um i thought that was really cool that everyone got so engaged in this topic um back from the time shapers discussion originally when they did this episode originally i thought it was probably one of my favorite episodes that they did i thought it was super interesting yeah definitely a good one definitely definitely cool well then we're supposed to play game two I'm supposed to and play game two this is um, a fun experiment because we we're like, what do we play? And you, you were thinking like, maybe we just try to find some consistent decks. And it turns out neither of us could really find like a super consistent deck that would have been like a good matchup. And so we were talking about like, how do we do this? And um, thankfully you have developed a pretty sweet tool that's going to help us out here mm -hmm. on Sloppy Lab Works website. Yeah. That anyone can use. Anybody can use. Uh, yeah, random access archives, is what we're calling it. Uh, and pretty simple but it's a glorified random number generator but put in a dok username and maybe some parameters uh min sass max sass expansion and i'll spit out a deck and it's kind of a nice way to play you know my decks sealed uh or 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 what have you um on the nordic servers and the miners we, we use it for one of the leagues the rabot uh, random access archives bot uh um uh, league so it's been a lot of fun but we thought we'd use it today and use it to pull a deck that neither of us are familiar with and then we both play it in a heads up mirror match uh, to kind of eliminate deck from the equation um, and that would be pretty cool now we we had talked 
initially about maybe using uh, not tonight one of not tonight's decks. I feel like I'm, I might know a lot of her decks. It might be fun to use somebody's from the chat if they want. Otherwise, we could idea. use well, not tonight's. But if anybody wants to like make sure that there are no shenanigans <laughs> and yeah. toss their uh, toss their DOK username into the chat. We'll, uh, and I think we, we'll we want to go for a min size of like 70, I think, just to make sure we get something that's like moderately functional, right? Yeah. Um, and then, I don't know, Dark Tidings, Mass Mutation, do you have a preference between the two? I think, oh, can 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 this bot choose uh, like a subset Ooh. of multiple sets or do you have to pick a set? This one we have to pick. There's the, uh, there's the, the Discord bot that I think lets you pick multiple. Uh, um, yeah, but here, all right. So, it's, uh, you know, I love dark tidings. Maybe we do mass mutation. I think dark tidings. We could be like staring at a screen, like <laughs> burning our brains trying to figure out the right thing to do. So maybe we just go with mass mutation. Okay, very good. Mass mutation, and we might need some help uh, signing random pips. We'll see. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, but as long as we do it the same, that'll <laughs> keep the experiment intact. Absolutely. Cool. So let's see, we got a couple suggestions. I'm gonna go with uh, the first one, Dinobot. We'll save you for the next one, One Star Peeps. All right, so let's go. And then I think we are also going to, so we're gonna make the TCO game like we usually do, but I think we're gonna make the password open so that anyone watching can jump into the game and we're gonna play with open hands, which will mean that you guys can kind of see the decisions we're making and you can determine if I am just ruining the skill part of this <laughs> by playing the wrong cards every turn. So you guys can look, look at the hands that way for both of us. Normally you can only see JTs, but you should be able to see both of ours this way. Um, so, all right. It looks like we have somewhat of a, uh, a nice sassy one here. Yeah, sassy indeed. I'm going to send the DOK link over to you. So we have uh, Best of Bolt, Palace Composer. All right, so we have some pips from uh, on this deck to assign. Okay, how many we got? Is there a lot? Not too many. I'm heading over to the crucible <laughs> now. Well, this is so easy. Uh, oh. We have to pick one <laughs> card to have double damage. And maybe if um, Dinobot knows this deck, maybe he could tell us which one has the double damage. Ooh. Otherwise, I think it's, it's okay. We can. Oh, Dinobot says they have the it. enhancements. Wow, look at this. I dig it. We don't need the, the verification image, but which one of these has a double damage? I think that's all we really need. Uh, actually, is is the image up on the DOK page? Yeah, it isn't. It is not. It is not. But we can pick one. Okay. How about? Oh, it's in Tropic Swirl. Very good. Excellent. All right. This is very scientific then. Um, the most science, all the science right here. <laughs> all right, what is this deck all about then? Um, whoa, 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 whoa. Are we not allowed to look at the deck? Oh, we can, I guess we can look, I don't know. Should we compare notes? Should we compare notes now? I don't know. Do you, I don't know, do you? Uh, no, let's, let's consider that a skill to see okay. if like we can look at this deck and kind of see what's going on. I'm checking out the list right now. Um, it is an interesting 79, I'll just say that. We can talk more about that later. Maybe Dinobot has thoughts on it and he can share with us later too. Mm -hmm. Not what I would have expected from a 79 mass mutation. Indeed. Interesting. Very cool deck. With the sloppy lab work, this was rigged. This was rigged. <laughs> Oh, there is a sloppy lab work. That's pretty cool. Um, all right, so I'll make a game. Um, and we're going to make the password. Let's make it luck. So anyone watching can jump in. And, oh, I didn't make it with the open hands. Let's try this again so that everyone can see our hands as well. Show hands. There we go. Password is luck for anyone that wants to see it. 
Otherwise, you can. I mean, obviously, hopefully, you stay in the in the stream anyway, too. But. <laughs> All right. Here we go. All good, right, good luck. Have fun. Have fun. <laughs> um. So. Um. I think I I I lose the first bit of luck because I always prefer to go first. So you're gonna mm -hmm. go first. There's the first variable we've encountered already. <laughs> Ooh, interesting. Um, yeah, good hand to start for me. Um, not sad about this. It's very interesting knowing that it's a mirror match. I feel like there are some things I would like to see, but I'm going to keep it. I'm going to have to have this deck list up on the side over here. Oof, interesting. See what's going on. And I'm kind of anticipating... Okay. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to roll with it and see what happens. And how can I how can I resist that as the uh as the first play? Pick off the festivities. Mm -hmm. Um so I wonder if I should play the bumblebird or discard the bumblebird. That's like an age-old question. Card is just I have some decks where I just legitimately want to discard it because there is the uh, soldiers the flowers. And the sooner that thing gets in the discard, the sooner it makes money for you. Um, mm -hmm. I think being that this deck only has that one alpha, I might as well just play it um, and then shuffle it right back in. Okay. Oh, I got a damage pip. I didn't realize he had a damage pip. Well, sorry, Cephalist. Self-inflicted wound there. Oof. Yeah. Yeah, I was really hoping, I was uh, considering mulliganing for one of the Lost in the Woods, just because there so, are so many witches. Um, but I didn't, obviously. There's a lot, of, a lot of creature control, I think, in general. Well, maybe not a ton. There's the Lost in the Woods. Uh, the Fangtooths. Once we get the Fangtooth rolling, this is going to be a totally different game. Mm-hmm. If we get the Fangtooth rolling. Maybe Almost. we just want to discard him. Maybe. There's no question what we're calling here. Oof. Hmm. Okay, cool. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> that looks familiar. Yeah. Oh man. And I I guess. <laughs> uh, <laughs> people are probably looking at our hands right now and uh <laughs> We are doing our best to reduce not just the deck aspect, but the luck aspect, because I'm probably going to play all the same cards you just played. Oh, man. <laughs> very, very funny how this is working out here. Um, yeah, I'm going to go right back into that. Um, so you have three beasts out there and a witch. Um Play my beast back again. Now that I have the beast, let's <laughs> reap with the cat. Um, I think I want to reap some more. And yeah, we're going to just put you in check. And definitely want to get rid of your, your witch. And I think the Lumilu is probably a good one to get rid of. And I'm probably just going to discard the look what I found because I don't know if I'm going to go back into Untamed. And I think that'd just be a chain. So <laughs> see if I force you to maybe call Untamed just to fight me. Yeah, super sad. Hmm. I mean, I... 
because you <sighs> you don't want to take me off check without killing the Fandangle. I really don't. I'm also just like not super worried about Fandangle. Starting from zero, I think the burst potential is not crazy. Yeah, only like what nine pips in here. Nine pips. I mean, you could have the swirl, but then you're just okay booked in. So there's there's potential for there's potential for a crazy logos turn, um, but I think we're not going to do that. Going to tempt the fates a little bit. Ooh. You draw a good one. Ooh, dangerous. <laughs> that is so sad. Ah, it must be the neurosiphon. It is the neurosiphon, indeed. I don't think. I just don't think I can play it, though. That's so sad. <laughs> <laughs> that is. Uh, yeah, that is pretty sad. Oof. Oof. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we're just going to let you forge. I like keys. That is nice that you got to uh, look what I found on the sloppy. Mm-hmm pretty nice yeah i All wasn't right. crazy uh, about cluttering up my hand with the the discard but all right okay yeah. so into logos so, yeah this isn't going to be super productive i'm okay uh, with that yeah i bet you are um okay. okay this yeah 23 creatures in this deck and uh i think we really need those fang tooths Otherwise, this is going to be a very board-heavy game, probably. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Do I care about my cephalos? Not really. So don't know that you're gonna hurt me with the Lumalu so much. How many more beasts do you got? Sacra Beast, Lumalu, Ghost Talk, Eunomia? Is that a beast? It is. Four beasts in the deck. Played one. Shuffled one. Hmm. Hmm. I think I'm okay with that. Okay, so let's reap. Let's use that action. Oh, wow. I'm a bit surprised you used that tank. Oh, interesting. Bot booked it into causal loop. Double causal loop. Very interesting. Almost want to just... No, it's fine. We'll give you that back in the archives. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Just where I want him. Yeah, interesting. Right, you're, you're at five now. So, um, yeah, I thought you were going to Qmex fight my Fandangle. Um, Mm -hmm. To not kill your your untamed. Um, yeah, the two the two there I wasn't I wasn't so worried about. All right. Back in the Let's, logos. Yeah. Let's. I think that's the only way. Well, let's just play the Eclectic first. See what I archive. Okay. Then... We'll 
reap there. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Got a great one. <laughs> Cause a loop. Gonna have some dirty archives here, but that's fine. Lots of efficiency. <laughs> Very pleased with that one. <laughs> Credibility of sloppy lab works, uh, skill stack, stock tanking. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Some shots fired in the, in the chat. Yeah, watch the chat because I don't want to see your hand. I'll have to go back and revisit. Mm hmm. Too funny. All right, let's reap. Discard and draw. Okay. Interesting. Cool, cool. Gonna reap. Mm hmm. Dirty archives, I hope. Mm -hmm. Yep. Quicksand. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, you got a lot of money there now, and I'm in a hole because there's not a ton of amber control in this deck. Um, I've got a beefy archives, not as beefy as yours, but I think I think this is my only option is to just try to cycle a bit and prepare, hopefully, for a pretty good turn. Yeah, this was a little bit of why I was inclined to reap with the um, uh, Cumex before. I kind of just wanted to sit in the archives at this point. I mean, I could have fought, but I was dying anyway. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So interesting. You got the double anguish, got the bone saw, got the cinder. I'm going to be at check. We've seen two lost in the woods already from you. Ooh, ooh. But in Tropic Swirl, we have not seen. Okay. Thinking about how safe my witch is. Not gonna cycle. Interesting. Four. Yeah. Do kind of want to get those anguishes off board. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we're going to go untamed, not take our archives. Going to reap. Gonna play a beast cat and a beast cat. And this guy. Okay. We're gonna send back damage pips and a beast cat. And your two anguishes. Okay, cool. Yep. Saw that one coming. Uh, it's a brutal, brutal play. It's like 
pretty much all the Amber Control um, that this deck has. There's like an Infernus somewhere, um, and apparently a Drekker. Mm -hmm. Rumor has it. Rumor has it. So, um, yeah, this is so. It's tough for a deck with with the uh, a lot of random archives like this because I feel like. I could take my archives, but I, I know I'm not drawing any cards then. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I know you have a big board that I am not going to be able to fully handle. So it's um, definitely very tough to figure out yeah, it's what like, to do here. It's like answers for immediate problems in, in archives, but there's going to be, yeah, some dry turns in there where you're probably going to need to stop a check a check for key yeah. three, yeah. And you have a very good chance of going to check next turn two. Mm -hmm. Unless I do something about it. And hopefully, hopefully some threats on board that we're hoping to be dealt with. Well, um, I think I'm, yeah, I don't love this, but I think I just got to, I think I just got to do it. Go back to Logos. Got the Entropic Swirl coming. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it's something. Um. Mm -hmm. Didn't draw any Logos this turn. Um. I can deal two damage, which isn't enough to kill anything. Um, but it's something, I guess. Yeah, don't like this at all. Um, if I don't kill the Fandangle here, then you'll probably just reap with some Logos and play the Fumex and a couple other things. Uh, actually, let's see here. That is all of your Logos creatures except for the Fumex. But you could go Dis. I'm going to take a chance here and let the Fandango live. I think I probably went through a similar <laughs> thought exercise that you did a couple turns ago. Um, I don't think it's going to make a huge impact for me. So I'm going to damage it, and then I'm going to kill off one of your bots. That one, I think. And then I'm just going to have to cause a loop something. Probably a card that is least valuable to me. Okay, that's a key. Interesting. So, I have to worry about Infernus, but I don't think you have many other ways of taking the off check out of hand. At least that, not that I haven't seen already. Stirring Grave has a damage pip. Okay, that could be cute. So nine, nine feels pretty safe. I don't think nine's happening. Four. <laughs> Bumblebird still in deck, staring at Bot Booked in. <laughs> Oh, well, that could be. Worse. I mean, it's not a. It's not an uh, Omega. Might That's true. Bounce, might just bounce. Bounce back. That's true. Okay. Can go. One, two, three, five. Yeah. Can we do better? Two, three. 
four, five. Go to check in Untamed with pulling the archives. Rather not pull the archives yet. But not going to check feels pretty bad too. Have to expect this is coming next turn. Certainly if I go to check. Hmm. Could make a bunch more threats. Though going to chat does feel very forcing. Yeah, I think that's... Remember the, remember the ABCs <laughs> of Keyforge. <laughs> I remember. <laughs> so this feels kind of bad. <laughs> checking. Can't go wrong. Can't go wrong. So I'm making a beast. Uh, Reapin. Reapin. Play in this one. Now I may have miscounted a little bit here. Oof. That is unfortunate. Was really hoping to save this lost in the woods for the uh, anguishes that are coming. Because you're going to take me off with Infernus and or a damage pip on your anguish. Hmm, gross. But I think I at least have to ask you if you did manage to draw that um, that Infernus. So sending those back, sending your dis back. Perhaps should have taken the bot booked in to stop Infernus off the top, but. We'll see. All right. So I uh, did not draw another Anguish. I did not draw an Infernus. Um, I think my only out here is to bot booked it into an Infernus, but that would just delay the inevitable. But let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sure. Let's take the archive. Uh, let's play the QMAX. And I just did the Infernus. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, you never, I mean, there's luck for you, folks. I mean, um, mm -hmm. that was it. Uh, good game. Yeah, it's, I literally drew the Infernus with the QMAX. <laughs> um, yeah. but it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have impacted. You know, I, I would have, uh, I would have purged two cards, you would have been at four, and next turn you would have um, just reaped back up and, you know, I, I wasn't able to draw anything. You know, mm -hmm. I couldn't have drawn back into the uh, the anguish anyway, and there's only one damage pip in dis, so um, right. wouldn't have been a huge, you know, best case is the one damage pip on the anguish anyway. So, uh, good game. I'm curious um, how, what the viewers think there with uh, the mirror <laughs> match. Did you guys feel there was luck involved there? Was it uh, me misusing my early Lost in the Woods. I thought your Lost in the Woods were perfect. That's like exactly what needed to happen, I think, to uh, not just get away with like the 12 Amber Burst that you had, but um, to make sure that, you know, um, my board was in check and I couldn't really like do much to take you off in the future. The um, the first one felt, felt well-timed. Um, the second one felt like a gamble but I think it was it was reasonable. I mean, uh, it was it was Amber number six. If you happen to have Infernus, Anguish, Anguish, I would have probably struggled for a couple turns, and it would have been a race for the key three. Um, but I don't think it would have been like uh, uh, it would have put me out of the game. And my other options were just not going to check, which maybe laying out a big dis turn there, uh, dis board there would have just put me really far ahead the following turn 
that may have been a stronger play. So probably could have played that a little bit better, but yeah, it did, did work out. So I don't know. Some luck, some luck in my favor for sure. Yeah, we didn't find the Fangtooths until very late. Um, mm -hmm. And I had both of the Lost in the Woods. I think I wasted the first one, which I think was the big blunder, probably. Um, mm. I just played it for a pip essentially early. Um, could have got it back with the look what I found, but I didn't. I knew I wasn't going to go back and untamed for a while, so didn't want to do that. Um, maybe could have held one. Maybe I could have held it, and then, you know, with the bumblebird out there, the next turn would have had the reap anyway. Um, so maybe that would have been the better play. The the lost in the woods do feel like key cards in the matchup. I I may have been better off discarding my look what I found as well. Um, but yeah, those lost in the woods do feel pretty key. Neither of us saw an early in furnace to kind of to kind of loop that around or anything with great great plays. I don't I don't know if there are great plays to uh, to loop around. I guess you've got the ghost hawk, which could do some things. Neither of us neither of us hit a turn one Lord Invidious, which would have been which would have been really tough to deal with too. Yeah, it would have been. Mm -hmm. I mean, lost in the woods is you know what you'd have to do or quicksand, but mm -hmm. um, that it could definitely disrupt your plans, you know, if you have to go out of your way to kill that Nvidia's turn one, for sure. Yeah, and when you when we looked at the when we looked at the deck initially and you said high SAS uh mass mutations but wasn't what you were expecting, I, I thought you were homing in on the uh on the the C breakdown there, but was it something else you were looking at? Seventy nine SAS but only nine amber pips. Um it didn't seem like a lot to me for a deck like that. You know Logos in Mass Mutation has a lot of Amber Pips, and this one doesn't really have that many. Um, also, 23 creatures is pretty high in a deck that high of Saz. So um, I thought that was another unusual aspect of it, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. That's 11 creatures in Dis, and I, like, barely called Dis that game. A... And you barely did either. Did you actually call Dis? I uh, good question. Did I call this? I don't think you did. Because your hand there, I see now your hand is just chock full of this creatures. Let's see. It was only eight turn game and your eight you know, seven turns were for you. <laughs> this was so this was called once between both of us. <laughs> yeah. And wow. then my creatures were immediately lost in the woods. That's funny, and I, to be to be fair, I probably should have gone dis instead of untamed. It may have been a better play on my turn seven. Um, although you wouldn't have gone into check though. I wouldn't have gone into check. I would have. I would have not gone into check, but I would have had a, a very large board um, for the following turn. So would you break that down into like a, a style choice then? Might have been a style choice. Uh, I think. It, I'd have to think about it a little bit more. Mm. <laughs> Maybe Dinobot can close in, but might even have been just a straight up misplay. Like worked out, and I got a lucky bounce for it having worked out. Um, but I think just looking at what was left in the deck for board control, burst potential, and amber control, uh, I think going untamed there, burning my lost in the woods. Um, and hoping and hoping that I could uh, come back from an infernus and taunted uh, taunted uh, anguish was hoping for a lot. You didn't have it, but it was hoping for a lot. Whereas laying out a board of I don't know if it was quite this many if I ever drawn since, but let's call it six disc creatures still having lost in the woods in hand um, would have been a pretty good position. I don't think that you were going to check. On the next turn. Yeah. yeah. That's, I mean, I feel like both of those, I would have probably done what you did. I would have definitely gone to check, I think. That was the most important thing in my mind in that situation, if I were you. But then looking at it again from the disc perspective, you know that my Lost in the Woods are gone. You know that your disc creatures are not going to be hit by Fangtooth. Um, I don't, yeah, you do have a Brabble in there. Um, mm -hmm. But like you could have gone dis right there, knowing your anguishes both would have been safe, and um, you probably could have centered your mm -hmm. Nvidia's, how many you had, um, and then having your anguishes there, 
and I think behind the taunt as well, I mean, essentially means that you're in complete control, right? Like, even if you're not in check that turn, next turn you just fight with an anguish and I can't forge, and then you can reap out with a ton. And that's possibly a safer play, right? Mm -hmm. um, it would have also given me, you know, an out in this game because I had no no amber control in hand. So it would have extended the game for me, but it still may have been the safer play for you. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think I'm inclined to agree. And I think most of the chats start <laughs> I'm inclined to agree too. <laughs> but uh but yeah, I mean all of what you said in furnace brings you down even 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 more the brabble and the two anguishes on board yeah even cinder can eat this the techno fiend if need be um yeah drecker is going to have a body between itself and a taunter mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. potentially even protecting the fandangle yeah, true. Um, there's enough damage pips. I put two damage on the Fandangle because yeah. I knew I was playing a damage pip next turn anyway. But yeah. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, you know, like you you definitely could have chosen one of those two styles and still come out ahead. I think they still would have both been good plays. Um, like maybe if we could rewind it and go the other way or maybe rewind it and give me an Inferno, something like that. Like maybe we could see something a little bit different. Um but I think I think the play you made was good, um, and you know I don't know because I, I wonder if that does kind of come down to your style, and I wonder if that does make an impact in a different way than like luck or skill might. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, very interesting, very interesting, cool. It was it was a good experiment. It was fun to play. I definitely felt like I was fumbling with the deck. Uh, a lot more than I would have if it was one that I knew well. Um, so I don't know. We we may have showcased. Well, it's interesting. There's there's skill that you measure uh, picking up a deck for the first time, and there's also um, maybe a different flavor of skill that shines through when you're playing with a deck that you've really mastered. Um, um, I definitely felt like some of my earlier turns, I had less of a clear sense of the end game I was playing towards. Um, and yeah, at the uh, the final turn here, looking back, if I did rewind it, Mega may have gone distance instead. Though I think, yeah, both were both were defendable kind of decisions. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I kind of bumbled early too, but I don't know. Maybe had I realized how much this was in there, maybe instead of... Um, I don't know. I think I, I got the efficiency I could with logos, but there was a turn when I had three logos, three discs. Maybe I could have gone into discs expecting to draw a couple more disc creatures and then just try to let the board roll. You know, like uh, maybe that would have been a different path I could have taken. But um, really hard to say. You know, I, I usually, if I have three, three like that with three logos, three discs, and the logos includes a little bit of efficiency, I'm generally going to go with the logos. Mm -hmm. I think most people probably would. Yeah, so tempting to use the use that logo sport, especially when it comes with draw and discards or free plays off the top. You know, even even I had some turns where I had no logos in hand, but you know, two discard reap abilities and a free play. It's still very tempting. Yeah, I mean, in in a matchup like this, when there's not very much creature control, I will generally lean towards using the board that I have, um, just making making amber that way, but. You know, the dis having 11 creatures is like a totally different variable in there. And I don't know, I, I guess if I went back and did it again, I would think about that aspect of it a little bit more. But I'm not sure how much I could have done about it. I so, think we both ended up having with dis on the bottom of our deck. Yeah, and, and some of that might have been me wielding a foot gun. I, I was often looking at those disc creatures in my own side of the board for Lost in the Woods when maybe I should have been trying to kind of establish that disc board um yeah yeah i i ended now with five discs in hand five discs in deck and one on the board so um really didn't see my disc but like on the other hand like that's almost a two house deck that i played and still like kind of struggled to to make too much amber in the second half and definitely struggled to build a board so um yeah i don't know 
it's a fun fun experiment um playing the same deck against itself um i don't think i've done that before if i'm not mistaken no i can't say that i have it was interesting really interesting um and all right and you know what Quatra? Um, I think this is the first one of these I've won, so I'm gonna take it and call it I didn't it all, want to. I didn't want to be skill. the one to say it. <laughs> uh, congrats, though, and it was well played and well earned. Yeah, good game, fun times, fun times, and good game. many thanks to Dinobot for the use of their deck. Yeah, very fun. Yeah, one star peeps, we owe you a game with one of your decks. Maybe the random access archives will pull one next week. For sure, for sure. Cool, cool, cool. All right. Well, it was a good chat. Uh, this was a really good episode. I'm really glad we got to do this. Um, it's a great Time Shapers episode. Um, if you haven't listened to it, definitely recommend listening to that. Um, but it's a very cool topic, and I, there's a lot of um, room for debate with it, I think, as we saw with a lot of the chat today in the stream and in Sanctimonious. So pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, folks, for coming out. hope it was good times. Uh, we will see you around the sloppy lab. See you next week. <laughs>